My application has triggers on most tables. And they, sorry, let's start again. My application has triggers on most tables that do a dim. Let me, let me try for a third time. My application has triggers on most tables, and the triggers on those tables do DML against other tables. And those other tables have triggers that do DML on other tables, et cetera, et cetera. So during a transaction, you know, it's hard to know exactly what's going on. You do an insert on one table, and that might have implications across 20 tables. And so the question is, during a transaction, is it possible to get a list of all the tables and row IDs that are being modified? Now, my first response to that question was, oh, this is one of my, uh, I often blogged and done videos about this. You know, triggers have their place. I think triggers are great, but I don't think they're a shortcut for building an application. I just don't think you should have, to have half your application logic in triggers. Uh, have that in Peel SQL code because then it's easily tracked. But yeah, uh, having DML floating around all over the place in triggers, I think is just a recipe for disaster. But to try and answer the question, uh, we need to understand a little bit about locking first. To under uh, We're going to talk about locking as to why what this person is asking for is pretty much impossible. If I create a table with just a couple of rows, one row, row one, row two, simple table, just two rows in it. If one session deletes one row, another session deletes the other row, they're allowed to do that, even though it's all in the same block, then Oracle needs to manage this. And the question is, how does it do it? Well, without delving too much into a block internals exercise, if we dump a block while those two transactions are active, deep in the block dump trace, we'll see this information here. Like here's row number one, and it'll have this thing called LB0x2. Here's row number two, LB0x1. What is all this stuff going on in, in, the, in the internals? LB stands for a lock byte. So when you lock a row in the Oracle database, we actually go to the row. And we actually put a little flag in a single byte saying, yes, this row is locked. Now, it's not just a yes or no. We need to know who locked it. In this case, one row is locked by lock byte number two, and this one is locked by lock byte number one. But what does that really mean? Well, further in that same block, we have a thing called the interested transaction list. This is the people that currently have an active transaction on this particular block. And that's what the lock byte points to. This lock byte here says this row is locked by interested transaction number two, which can go up to here, and transaction two. How do we undo that transaction? Where well, we would go to this area of undo. UBA stands for undo block address. And that's how, in, in 30 seconds or less, transactions work. Transaction says, give me a slot here. My transactions, the rows that I lock, will be locked with my lock byte. And if I, I mean, never do a roll, it needs to do a rollback, I would go to here in the undo area, and that would be where I'd start to find all the information to do my undos. But the key thing is here is really is, the lock information for a row is stored on the row. And why is that important? Well, it means that the number of locks you can have in an Oracle database is infinite, which a lot of databases aren't like that. They have a lock database, so to speak, a lock structure which controls what rows are locked. We don't have one in the Oracle database. We, you know, it's actually on the row itself. If you've got a billion rows, you can have a billion locks. The number of locks is infinite. And the best thing is the cost of locking a row is zero because you have to go to a row anyway if you're planning on locking out know, planning on changing it and so simply flipping your byte you know is no is zero so that's one of the great things of oracle is infinite locks zero cost to take them which is cool but that comes at a price and that is people say well you say there's not a lock database but there's a view called beta lock surely that shows the locks in the database let's very briefly explore why that's actually not the case Create a table as a copy of scott.m, so 14 rows. If I go look at Vidal lock, just for particular locks which are related to tables and rows, it's tm and tx, there's no locks at the moment because I've just created a table. If I delete one row and then look at the lock database, this is where people think, ah, yes, unfortunately it's wrapped around a bit, hasn't it? I'm not sure. Not sure. Uh, people say, ah, yes, look, see, I've got a table lock, tm, that'll be on my empt, uh, my t table. And I've got a locked row, TX, because I deleted one row. And people see the other lock, and they go, ah, yes, that's a locked database. But if I update the other 13 rows, so now I've got 14 rows locked. How many entries in VDL lock are there? Well, still only two. This isn't an indication of a row being locked or of each row being locked. 
This is an indication that you have some row locks on this object. That's it. It's not a lock database. It's not a list of all the rows that are locked. Beta lock is about the lock resources that are allocated, not the rows that are locked. So I just wanted to put that uh, falsehood to bed. One thing you do get though, is we have a transaction. A transaction tells us what's going on that we have an active transaction on the database. Maybe this is a way of tracking those rows. So what you could do is, for example, is try use that transaction in, Beetle, in flashback transaction query, part of flashback database for that known transaction, right? But do you get it? Um, unfortunately, no. You only get that information if you've turned on supplemental logging across the entire database, which in itself has its own implications and therefore uh, probably not really a way in which you can get the row IDs. You could probably get a little bit closer by using the versions between syntax and that'll give you effectively versions of the rows that have been changed. But once again, you would need to know the list of all the tables that have been changed by your triggers. So that would require some tracking in its own right. So this gets you effectively some deltas as to what's going on, but it's nowhere near picking up all the entire rows. So I wanted to put to bed that video lock is not going to give you that list of rows. The blessing and curse of the fact that we have infinite locks of zero cost is the fact that we, because we don't track them, you can't see all the rows that have been changed. If you really needed to, you could do some extreme things. You could use log miner um, and golden gate or materialized view logs, put a materialized view log on every single table, and then you would be able to sort of capture it. You could do that, but it's a big deal. Maybe probably materialized view logs would be where I'd be looking uh, in terms of if you wanted to, as a one-off exercise, you know, work out what's going on. But I think ultimately, if you want to work out what's going on in a myriad of triggers is really just instrument your code. Cop that hit, go in there, Put in some debugging code in all your triggers because if you've got all this DML in your triggers, they are actually part of your application. So you may as well go ahead and you know put instrumentation in your application um, and then use that to maybe refactor the code out to peel some more.